Hi, I'm Walt Boys. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of Ring of Fire Press and editor-in-chief of the Grantville Gazette. And I'm your moderator for this panel on religion in the 1632 universe. Um, we've put together a group of people who uh, are, are quite familiar, almost expert in the subject. Uh, um, we have uh, Griffin Barber, who uh, will uh, come from primarily discussing the conflict of religions um, in the subcontinent of India. We have Ivor Cooper, uh, who will talk about uh, the Eastern religions and their effects on, uh, on China and Japan. We're going to have Dorn Hassler and Virginia DeMars. We're going to talk about uh, Christianity and the causes of the 16 of the 1632 series and the six and the uh, 30 years war and we're going to have Natalie Silk who is going to come from the the Judaic tradition uh, and what we're going to try and do is to give equal balance and cover and coverage to the entire world religions in the 1632 universe this is not a Eurocentric uh, um, series any longer. And uh, uh, so go ahead and uh, um, we, need to, uh, we need to start off. Um, Ivor, why don't you start with uh, what's, what is happening in Japan and China? Okay, so I should say that I am not an expert on the doctrines of these religions. My focus has been on how they have gotten involved in politics and how they affect the culture, particularly in ways that would matter in terms of the storytelling. Uh, one of the Complications you You're have welcome. is first of all, not as excuse me. I'm getting a you, your internet connection is unstable message, unfortunately. Okay, um, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so the with in regard to Confucianism, some will classify it simply as a philosophy, it's also been called a civil religion. There's really, uh, but it, it's a philosophy that got intertwined with the earlier folk religions that you have. Um, they, uh, there, is, there are various scholars that have written and various treatises that have been written in that field, uh, and they take different perspectives, some very much a conformist nature, some reformist, some in between. There's no formal priesthood. There mm -hmm. is an official cult that barely involves anyone outside the capital and in particular outside the imperial court. That is a good part of the life of the emperor is going and making sacrifices to one entity or another, Emperor on High, the August Earth, uh, the God of the Ramparts who, uh, you know, the protector of cities and so mm -hmm. forth. But those aren't rituals that anybody else is observing elsewhere in the empire. That's his job to act as an intercession. Mm -hmm. And he may have at times a cast of thousands to help with the the ritual, but that it's all centered on him. There are Confucian temples. They're associated significantly enough with schools and examination halls. And, um, and of course, the, you have the concept, the, the, the extended patriarchal concept that is um, the, filial duties of son to father, but 
also of citizen to emperor, um, wife to husband, yeah, that's the way they think of it, and so forth. But it has to be understood that that's not considered to be a one-sided link to their obligations that are supposed to be extended in the other direction as well, and the reformist elements in uh, Confucian thought emphasize those when they think the the emperor, the bureaucracy in particular, are getting out of line. Uh, What's the difference between the, the Confucian priesthood, if you will, and the bureaucracy? Well, there really is no priesthood. There is none. But as a practical matter, it's the state officials and teachers and the like that are teaching the Confucian philosophy to get into the bureaucracy to become official, you have to master, at least on a rote basis, the various fundamental works of Confucian thought. And so there's a, a self-reinforcing element there. And there's a, a lot of ritual. Of course, the whole thing with ancestor worship is partly you know, remnants of the primordial religion, but it's also uh, a driving force. And the important thing about ancestor worship from our context is that it was the single most divisive issue so far as the preaching of Christianity in China. That is, the, when the Jesuits came in, they initially started out uh, figuring out that they were going to do I think, Ivor, we've lost you. you frozen. Top down strategy. Can you? Maybe now I'll I try. Can. Maybe I'll try stopping my video and see if that improves things. If it's only trying to do an audio signal, is that okay? If you must. We'd uh, like to have you on audio and and video both. Now you've gone away. All right, let's, well, Ivor is trying to figure that out. Um, let's, let's shift to, uh, let's shift to Griff uh, and talk about the, the, uh, um, the fundamental um, three-way uh, discussion uh, uh, of religion in the, uh, in the Indian subcontinent and what happens when a fourth religion horns its way in. Well, it's actually, uh, it's a multitude of religions, really, the, uh, and subdivisions, really, within those religions. But uh, your primary actors, uh, as far as the Ring of Fire is concerned, are the uh, newcomer uh, Catholics uh, and uh, uh, a little, to a lesser extent, the Church of England, which were preferred over the uh, Catholics because they had, uh, by the uh, Mughals in any case, because they had less uh, ornate um, masses and that kind of thing that they uh, uh, enacted while they were there. But that was mostly later on. The In the initial um, contact between Jesuits and uh, the Mughal Empire, it was kind of, uh, you're just another guy, group of guys trying to uh, uh, promulgate and proselytize your religion amongst us and we've got plenty of religion so so long as you pay your taxes we're good with you um the so you have the uh the sunni uh, majority as far as muslims are concerned you have the hindu majority as far as the actual populace is concerned mm -hmm. and then you have the shia minority which is also uh, on, on occasion, it's on the rise in the 1630s uh, because of the influx of Persians uh, into, um, into India and into northern uh, India at the time from via, uh, because of the purges that were going on in Persia, <laughs> they had taken place. So, and then you have the, the militarization of the Sikhs also going on under sixth guru Hargobind Singh. So yeah, there's a big mix going on. But 
depending on who you read, as far as the history is concerned, and their kind of uh, individual uh, social acts that they want to grind, as far as history is concerned, the Mughals were really, they were like the Romans. We don't care. Pay your taxes. Uh -huh. so, as you, so long as you do what you do, and they were much more inclusive as far as the ruling class than anybody else had been previously uh, into in, inclusive as far as who could be a part of the ruling class um, because they took everybody. And uh -huh. it was part of their inheritance uh, ritual, the civil wars that went on with their inheritances that they, um, the, the son in comp competition for power would take the out group and make him part of his in group. And when he rose to power, they would be part of the new power elite uh, and would kind of refresh the entire ruling elite and incorporate uh, some of the old enemies now as the, uh, the supporters of the new king or emperor uh -huh. as they went along. So uh, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of tolerance going on um, that has been kind of glossed over in the, uh, in present day history because people want those divisiveness, that divisiveness to uh, secure their place in history currently and what they're doing now. Which is primarily uh, to do with the Muslims and the Sikhs because there's a lot more, there's a lot more Hindus than there are Muslims and Sikhs in the subcontinent. Yes, currently there, the, uh, certainly in India itself, there's a lot of, uh, but currently there's a big response from the Hindu community. Hindu nationalism is a big thing. And because they were always uh, um, a, uh, I want to say bureaucratic elite, they were the ones that made things run uh, mm -hmm. at their literacy rates and education were far superior to anybody else at the time. Uh, they uh, were the ones everybody had to rely on in order to enact their policies. What's uh, the difference between the Hindus and the Sikhs? So the Sikhs are monotheistic. Uh, the Hindus are not. Uh, they are, are very much, uh, they have a plurality of, of deities. Uh, depending on which, there's some, Hindu is very, very complex, and I don't claim to have a whole lot of knowledge about it, but the yeah. fundamental the fundamental difference uh, between them and Sikhism is Sikhism believes in there is a fundamental or monotheistic where there is one God and that God encompasses everything, which includes your, your Hindu gods and, and some of that stuff as well. But it's very, very uh, uh, part of the reason why the Muslims were able to reach an accord with the Sikhs was you're a people of the book. Um, it's a different book. But you're but still, it's still yeah, it's still, you know, the God's messenger came to earth, but it's not our messenger, but there's always all in, in Islam, there's always respect for prophets uh, mm -hmm. in general and an acceptance of, you know, hey, there's a bunch of different prophets. Jesus Christ was a prophet, et cetera. They, they feel that uh, you can incorporate uh, certain elements of this and they'll figure it out eventually. Um, uh, you know, if we continue to show them the right path, everybody else will figure it out and Sikhism uh, was pastoral and peaceable up until uh, sixth guru um, and the current writings have it that it was basically as a response to uh, the villainy of uh, the ruling class uh, of the Mughals but there's there's strong proof that it was just we're sick and tired of getting kick, kicked around by everybody um, and uh, they took it upon themselves to go ahead and, and uh, militarize and become masters of their own fate. Uh, and they did for the next 200 years, uh, at least. They uh, still are. Yes. But it's, even at that, in that era, so if you look at like the, uh, the late 19th or the early 19th century, they were extremely powerful mm -hmm. in Northern India and uh, had their own state, et cetera. So there's, there's some different uh, stuff going on. And again, it's, it, uh, they're, they're monotheistic and their um, uh, adherence to uh, prophets or people that are actually speaking the word of God set them apart from uh, Hinduism, which is uh, very much a plurality of, uh, um, uh, I don't want to say faiths, but a plurality of deities. Thanks. Um, Ivor, are you back? I hope so. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can hear I you. Turned off the virtual background. Hope that'll improve the. Uh... Well, it has. It, it's you sound a little better. Uh, do you want to talk about Buddhism a little? Um. Yeah. So, I haven't dealt with. Uh, there haven't been any professed Buddhists that have appeared in the China novel that Eric and I did. Uh, but some of the, one of the interesting, uh, of course, they have the concept of reincarnation, that you're going through cycles, that you earn good or bad karma as a result of your actions, and that dictates where you end up next. And eventually, hopefully, you get enough so you achieve nirvana. Uh, there are lots of Buddhist sects, and they have all sorts of different interpretations alike. But I uh, want to comment on one thing which hasn't shown up in the novels yet, but I think is amusing. Um, so because they have this concept of karma, one significant aspect of the book trade in China that cater to Buddhists were manuals that detailed for every action they could think of a score plus this much karma for giving fish to your neighbor <laughs> off that much for slapping your son because he didn't like something he said to you etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it was the, their equivalent of an, an app for wet, weight watching right that they would keep track of this stuff and write down the numbers and calculate it each day and get a little nervous and the like. So that's why I had never heard that before. That is hysterical. And well, I have not had the opportunity to work that one in yet. Now, right. another thing which ties into that is, of course, there's respect for animal life, which is manifested through vegetarianism and the like. But another little cultural thing that the Buddhists in China would do, also in Japan, um, is that they would, that people would raise birds and other animals specifically to sell to the Buddhists so that they could then free them and thus earn karma. Okay, cool. So, Didn't there wasn't there a, a problem? Uh, in, especially in Japan, of uh, uh, the monks getting awfully warlike? Yeah, so what happened, uh, and uh, you know, the Christians also got into trouble by getting involved in politics, but there were some very, uh, during the 16th century period with Sengoku, the, the, civil, the time of war, there was um, several um, very militant temples and essentially Hideyoshi, who was uh, one of the great unifiers of Japan, stomped down on them, defeated them militarily, and then forced some of the temples to split into separate groups that would then be fighting for worshippers, resources, and the like in order to be, mm -hmm. destroy their power. Now, with regard to Christianity in Japan, one of the ways they got into trouble was by getting it backing particular sides in those civil wars and the, the, when they did not necessarily back the winning parties, that was re remembered. And so once uh, the Tokugawa had unified Japan, and they realized that they could get the trade goodies they wanted from the Dutch. Uh, things were got a little dicey. Uh, it also didn't help, for example, when uh, there was a wreck, uh, the San Felipe shipwreck, and the captain freely explained to the Tokugawa interrogators that the policy of the Spanish king was to send in missionaries as a uh, as a force to of subversion and then to so create a, a guerrilla force that would then rise up when they the Spanish invaded. This did not go over well either. So uh, 
it's politics and religion tend to be very volatile mixes. Yeah, this is this too is one of the last periods in global history where everybody had about the same level of armament. Almost, you know, there were musketeers in Japan and in China, uh, in India, um, and all over Europe. And people do war games now, trying to see whether a Tokugawa army from 1620 or 1630 uh, could take Maurice of Nassau, um, the, the great uh, Dutch general. Uh, and I've seen a couple of those war games played out and uh, it comes out half and half. Sometimes Maurice loses. Uh, and so this, th this is an interesting thing when religion starts to play politics. It's one of the fascinating things I think um, that you guys are all writing about in the 1632 series. Yeah, another um, place where politics got, a, I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. So there were reformist factions from time to time in China. One of them was called the Donglin faction. Um, and it, during the 1620s, there was a violent reaction against it because uh, uh, the particular individual became the grand secretary in that period. And a good, there were some Donglin faction members who were Christians or at least sympathetic to the Christians thought it was worth mm -hmm. in Scholars. So one of the ways of making an indirect attack on a Donglin faction member, if you were not a, a member of the opposing faction, was to accuse him of being a Christian or a Christian sympathizer. So you mm -hmm. wouldn't attack him politics directly, you would use the Christianity as an excuse. And that was seen there. The In the um, China venture, Fang Yiji is one of the main characters, and his father had been a member of the Donglin faction, not a Christian, but he was one of the ones who lost his position because of the change in the, the politics. Mm hmm Okay. Um, let's shift gears and um, let's have uh, Bjorn and Virginia talk about um, the Thirty Years' War, Christianity versus Protestantism. Um, and um, you can get into the uh, various Protestant sects if you like. Uh, and the uh, floor is yours. You'll see Bjorn, so I'll start if that's all right. Sure, go ahead, Virginia. Uh, one of the things that I am noticing increasingly as we are several years into the series is a tendency for a lot of the, both some of the writers and some of the fans to sing Tom Lear's National Brotherhood Week without realizing that the man was totally sarcastic about it. Uh, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Uh, the ability of the uptimers to get everybody on board with mutual toleration is going to be limited. Now there will be a lot of people in Europe who are willing to live with the idea of mutual toleration. Uh, there is an interesting book about the century between the Reformation and the 1630s in Osnabrück, which has the title Miteinander Leben live with one another because they mm -hmm. had to live with one another because the diocese was approximately 
40% Catholic, 40% Lutheran, and 20% Calvinist, with a few sprinklings of Mennonites and Jews. And unless they wanted to be fussing all the time, they had to deal with having even what they called simultaneum, in which the same building was used by different religions at different times of the day because they didn't have the money to buy, build two churches for two different congregations. <laughs> they just had to live with it. On the other hand, you have, as you come into the 1630s, across northern Europe in particular, Northern Germany in particular, you're coming out of the era of Ferdinand II's Edict of Restitution and a great deal of bitterness mm -hmm. here and there under what caused it. So whether or not people are going to be functioning in a kind of live and let live environment as time goes on, I say is going to be very spotty. There will be places where it works and there are going to be places where you have constant brush fires that the government is going to have to be running around and sprinkling a little water on here and there to calm things down. Moving out of the context of the United States of Europe, naturally the rest of Europe is much more complex. Uh, Scandinavia is going to be very reluctant. Its monarchs are going to be very reluctant to do anything beyond diplomatic immunity. The same, to tell the truth, will be the case in England, because England is still extremely touchy about a few little problems that have developed in history, like the Armada. They're thinking about it still, a half century later. Uh, just as people today think of things in politics, that happened in the not too distant past. France is going to be looking at the possibility of civil war. Uh, the Spanish and the Italians are not going to be interested in moving in a direction of toleration very much. The Spanish probably not at all. So you have in the context, a lot of possibilities where things are not going to go smoothly. Uh, we're not going to skid into the modern world by having somehow managed to skip the Enlightenment. It isn't going to work that easily. Mm -hmm. There is going to be much more, or as I have, you know, dealing with other things. Uh, there's what I'm going to call investment in the status quo. Mm -hmm. uh, if you recall the little bit of dialogue that I wrote in the manuscript you have now between uh, the Abbess of Fedelenburg and uh, Iona Nelson, in which Iona listens to the Abbess's description of the great Lutheran Prince Bishop Bricks and Prince Abbeys of Northern Germany and says, but that's just sick. Luther was out to abolish that. And the Abbess says, well, I'm sure his intentions were of the best but they didn't survive the way the royalty and high nobility of Northern Germany and Scandinavia play church politics. 
<laughs> uh, you know, basically, she's a pragmatic woman, uh, and mm -hmm. she herself is a part of that environment, uh, and they're going to have an investment in the status quo, and they're going to have, and our authors and our fans are going to have to realize that the status quo is not the same all over the USE. So there will be different kinds of investments here and there. Mm -hmm. So I want, if Bjorn's around, I'll turn it over to him to take <laughs> it on from there. He's more theological. Obviously, I'm socio-political when it comes to religion. Yeah, but we yeah. like we like both. Um, mm -hmm. Bjorn, what do you think, in light of what uh, Virginia just, just said, what do you think the effects of uh, uh, character groups like the Bibel Gesellschaft and some of the other things you've written about um, uh, are really going to have uh, as the series goes forward. Well, the Bibel Gesellschaft is following in the footsteps of some of the um, notable religious writers who were already there, like Grotius, who Mm -hmm. corresponded with people who weren't already on his side. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody said at some point, everybody corresponds with Grotius. It's no big deal. Uh, so I, I hope that there can be a scholarly approach that's going to um, cross denominational lines. Mm -hmm. But um, is that going to stay in the universities? Uh, and in the synods, or is it going to uh, expand out into the in, into the general population? I, I think Virginia is right that it's going to depend on the area. Like right around in in Grantville itself, there are six or eight different denominations that are used to working together on certain things. Uh, their, their ministers at least meeting together once a month to see what's going on. Uh, and um, even Gustav acknowledges that down in the Oberfalls, um, the idea of not having an established church is probably a good one because it's passed back and forth between Catholicism, Lutheranism, and um, Calvinism so many times that if they just let everybody alone for a while, you know, that might work out rather than trying to force everybody back the way they were, you know, three conquests ago. It's sort of what happened in England. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the English took what they wanted from Catholicism as far as, uh, as far as literature, theology, and, and liturgy is concerned. Um, and uh, they still say uh, about Anglicans that they are, uh, um, they're Catholics who are too smart to pay the Pope for the privilege of religion. Uh, well, this, look, Walt, uh, when the cover artist was doing the cover for the Pastor Kastenmeier stories, one thing she said was, I can't really find much about what the altar arrangements and vestments were for the Lutheran clergy in this period. And I said, that's because they didn't change. The Lutherans didn't go to the black Geneva gown. They kept right on using the paraments and the vestments that they had on hand. And if you Look at them today. They happily march around in white silk and red damask as a slight mm -hmm. opportunity. Uh, the, the Lutherans are regarded by many denominational Protestants as no more Protestant, really, than the Catholics, except for a couple of little doctrinal bits and pieces. Yeah, yeah. Catholic, Catholic light is what I've, I've heard them referred to as yes. Catholic light. Yes, uh, although, although I, have, uh, I was shocked. I went, to, uh, I went to a Lutheran mass um, in the little town of Hutto, Texas, 
which is near, which, which is just south of Austin, or north of Austin, rather. And um, I had grown up a Catholic, and the Lutheran Mass looked like pre-Vatican uh, II Catholic Mass. Yes, and it will continue to, because Lutherans do not like to change. <laughs> it's a, well, it's a major thing to decide to use more pepper in a hot dish. Yes. <laughs> You'll pardon me for, for yes. being a little, a little snarky there. Well, Martin Marty uh, used to say that the most astonishing thing about the Reformation was that it did change something given the general <laughs> reluctance of Lutherans yeah. to change anything at all. So, um, so you don't think it's gonna, it, that the, the coming of uh, the uh, Americans is gonna have that much change in the way uh, the Christian religions are practiced. Not fast, and not, you know, not smoothly. It's going to be the pebble in the pond. Mm -hmm. The closer you are to the Grantford, Grantville, Magdeburg corridor, the more change there is going to right. be, and the further away you get, the less change there's going to be in practice. What Grantville is causing in part is opportunities for groups to talk to each other that they might not have had at high official levels before. Mm -hmm. For example, there's interaction between the Hussites of Bohemia and the um, the Mennonites and they, the other brethren from the Radical Reformation. And there was probably always some of that at a low level, but now there's an opportunity where they can, you know, sort of officially talk and discover mm -hmm. they have some things in common and they have some differences. And, the, uh, and when you lift your gown, um, the bad guys don't have cloven hooves. Uh, mm -hmm. Natalie, Let's talk about what it would what it was like to be uh, a Jew in the 17th century in Europe, and whether the coming of Granville would make a change in that, in in that. In in my stories, um, I don't touch on I don't make comparison between Sephardic Judaism and Ashkenazi Judaism. In other words, Judaism from Spain, which basically you had to practice under cloak and dagger, under mm -hmm. clo behind closed doors in hushed whispers. Where in Poland, it was more free. You can actually have. Uh, temple, you can actually openly practice to a degree. Mm -hmm. Just as long as you stayed in your village and you did not wander out, you're fine. Again, now I have a family who is from Spain trying to make their way in this strange new world where they can, they're practicing what I call Reform Judaism. You can eat um, rabbit and all the other good stuff. Just don't let anybody see you. <laughs> is, is, is Reformed Judaism an actual thing in the 17th century? No, or it isn't. You, uh, you made that part of the change. I made that, I, kind of did a jibe towards um, Reformed Judaism. No offense to anybody out there. Um, I hey, just wanted to this, show this that it's, called, it's about religion. religion. It's good. This panel's about religion. It's going to offend somebody. Cool. <laughs> no, no, Reformed Judaism, Reform Judaism was no such, it wasn't there at that time. It was mm -hmm. just that here, this, here is the Spanish family 
they happen to be Jewish under behind closed doors and pulled curtains and they are assimilated into the general population and mm -hmm. There was this rabbi who came over to their home, to their home and saw various stages of rabbit being prepared. Mm -hmm. So that was my job in saying, you know, let's get back to basics. This is how you cook. This is how you eat. This is how you pray. And it's very, and it's very, very regimented. Women mm -hmm. um, at that time, were not supposed to know how to read and they were not to be educated in Judaism, but they were supposed to help their children become learned. Cool, that's, that's a good one. How do you do that? I still don't know. <laughs> I, have, I have no clue, but that's just the way things are. Um, mm -hmm. Men and women are segregated in, in gatherings, you would never address a married man as a as a as a single woman. I would never address you. I, I could never. Uh, I would never even associate with you. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to ask you a favor, I had to go through your wife first. Mm. And so, if I if I was a if, in if fact, I wanted. Uh, and if I wanted to have something to do with you, uh, I needed a meal or something like that, I would have to go through your husband. Correct. But I have to be careful because you're not of the tribe. Okay, right. But Walt, remember again, much of this is Mediterranean. Much of this is Mediterranean culture. You'll mm -hmm. find the same customs outside of Judaism in much of Italy, mm -hmm. in the Iberian Peninsula, around in Greece. Uh, it's hard sometimes to sort out what is regional culture from what is specifically religious culture, which is one of the reasons I think that the series is working as well as it has. Because if Grantville had landed in a Mediterranean environment, in, an, in a Medi Mediterranean cultural environment, it would mm -hmm. have been so much more alien to the uptimers. Mm -hmm. but you next, yeah. To your I, second question, I think this will be being in Grantville or having Grantville's influence will be a great thing because, and I, I pulled that information from Grantville, from uh, the texts that people have been giving me. And it shows in my work that the family is starting to practice their religion openly and a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that was that was cool to me was in in researching on the Judaism and the the Spanish Inquisition and all that was the originally Spanish Jews they were being uh, the Spanish Inquisition was after them they fled to to Portugal and other parts if they didn't convert they were if they weren't forced to convert they fled to Portugal and the Portuguese kings like I'm going to reap the benefit of having all these uh, incredible artisans and and intellectuals. Uh, in service to the crown uh, and to my empire. And everybody's like, yeah, that's great. And the, the uh, Jewish people knowing that, you know, this isn't forever. If this king goes down, we're going to be caught. They, they spread out along the Portuguese trade routes everywhere that the Portuguese were. Mm -hmm. So they were in India. They were in, mm -hmm. uh, in North America, South America, everywhere that the, the Spanish touched upon or the excuse me, the Portuguese touched upon, they were there too. Um, and whether they were openly practicing or not, um, but one of the benefits they saw of going to the far flung parts of the empire was to get away from the, the, the witch burners, the people that were trying to uh, experiment. We'll seize the fortune that I have. So uh, fascinating. Now in real, now in our actual yeah. history, 
many of the Jews who fled from Spain ended up in France. Mm -hmm. Ivor, did you have something you wanted to throw yeah, in? Yeah, I had wanted to point out that in Seas of Fortune, Henrique uh, was a secret Jew living in Brazil in the Bellum region, which is about mm -hmm. as far flung as you could get, pretty much, well, other than India. So mm -hmm. that was just an example that in the series of the, the type of diaspora that uh, Griffin was talking about. Yeah, and it sticks around too. My uh, longtime business partner's wife uh, was raised as a member of the uh, oldest synagogue in the uh, Western Hemisphere in Recife uh, in Brazil. Um, it's only been there since 1580 or something like that. Uh, that, was the, that was the way to get through the diaspora the Spanish Inquisition wasn't going to go to Portugal, uh, and Brazil is Portuguese still. Um, the, that, changed, the religion, that changed eventually, but... <laughs> well, uh, it's amazing how Portuguese Brazil still is. No, I, I mean, as far as the, the, uh, when the, with the combination of the crowns under the Spanish king... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. The, the, uh, uh, but then... Then in the, in the 19th going, century, out and going elsewhere. Then in the 19th century, um, the uh, Portuguese crown moved to Brazil, and for uh, 50 years or so, uh, it was a Brazilian empire instead of a Portuguese empire. Um, the, there are some religions that we haven't really talked about that are going to have more and more to do with um, the 1632 universe. Um, and that's the religions of Africa and the native religions of South America uh, and of the uh, uh, and of the North American natives. Uh, and uh, they're getting talked about more and more. Uh, do you have a friend, Virginia? A cat, yes. He's very uh, interested in what's happening. Cool. Maybe he can talk something about Calvinism. He seems to be black and white. <laughs> they, um, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the various African religions um, as we talk more and more about what's going on on the continent of Africa. Uh, Eric Flint and I are going to start writing a book about interior Africa and the slave trade sometime hopefully this year uh, unless he gets a chance to write something else better uh, uh you don't know anything about that do you guys uh <laughs> how long how long did your novel sit there griff uh for you well, this one's the the cool thing is peacock thrones coming out in may so yes. that's cool. uh that's very fast track very, relative to mission very good uh, so we we are trying to be um, ecumenical and small C Catholic uh, all the way around the world in the 1632 universe. Um, I find the collision of religions fascinating, uh, um, especially since some of them are going to come out, I suspect, a little better than they did um, in the original timeline. Uh, I think uh, uh, Zen Buddhism uh, and Shinto are going to uh, come out a whole lot better uh, now that uh, you've given uh, the Japanese the entire West Coast of North America uh, to colonize, Ivor. Uh, well, that's going to be well, weird we'll all by itself. We'll see what happens to that coast uh, in the, the next one. I really can't talk about that right now, uh, but it's inevitable that while well, the Japanese are the first on the coast in terms of colonization in the new timeline, that others will be uh, poking in there. There are just too many resources for it not to happen eventually. 
of course, the Spanish are going to have more trouble getting up there because of the revolution uh, in Santa Fe um, that has happened earlier in the new timeline than it did in the old timeline. Um, we have uh, we have a few minutes left, um, about five minutes, I think. Um, let's go around and everybody, everybody sum up. Um, Bjorn, why don't you start? Uh, I think that in Europe, we're going to see uh, accommodation between different Christian denominations It'll be um, open in some areas and more grudging in other areas. Um, and then we'll see cross-pollination between groups that didn't used to talk to each other. What do you think is going to happen um, with religion in North America? I think we'll see at least one new direction among the European settlers and at least two new directions among the Native American tribes who adopt things at various levels. Vague is your friend. <laughs> Virginia? I am inclined to think that the politics of religion will remain important. That mm -hmm. people will continue, as they still do unto this very day, it's not going to become as secular as Eric wishes it would. <laughs> I'm sorry to put it that way. But uh, basically, Eric is secular-minded, and he would like to see a more secular culture develop quite rapidly. Whether it will or not is a different question, as I, again, have Frederick of Denmark saying with some frustration to his half-brother as he looks out the window, and Pastor Litzeman was saying, perhaps they would, should change the translation in the Bible. I'm sure it's going to be much more wonderful to have sorceresses running around free than witches. You know, he's <laughs> still thinking in the same terms. Uh, and he's going along with it, because this is the law now. He keeps saying to his subordinates, there are no witches. That's the party line. Well, there are none. Go oh, deal with it. There aren't any. <laughs> what they believe is a different issue. Mm hmm But indeed so. Um, Natalie? I happen to agree with Virginia that politics and religion go hand in hand because politics mean, means money. And that's, and I don't think that in the new timeline, Judaism is going to be as tolerated as it may be today, but they'll just look at them as in, you can practice what you want in your village, don't come out of your village. Mm -hmm. Griff? So the, it really depends on who wins the Civil War. Um, the dividing line uh, in the, uh, the real timeline that we have seems to be Aurangzeb. Uh, and if he wins uh, and he's like he was, uh, according to modern historians, then it's probably going to go the Islamic route and pave the way for somebody to come in and topple them eventually. Uh, because there will not be that refreshment of talent and skill and that kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. and tolerance of other religions. It will be... Uh, very divisive and uh, the uh, continuous uh, need to crack down on the very people that support the elites uh, will result in the elites being deposed. 
much faster. So I, I would say that, uh, yes, it's the, the, the politics are very much uh, in, uh, intrinsic to the uh, religion and vice versa, but it also depends on uh, the driving forces that are, are, are pushing it as, as the, um, because these people have a second chance as opposed to uh, the real timeline. They have historical references about their own time in which to, mm -hmm. to kind of study and go, well, you know, this is where we went wrong. And can we change course? Can we do better uh, with this knowledge? Mm -hmm. Ivor? So I think the biggest evolution uh, in terms of religion in my I heard you went away. <laughs> Bailwick is going to be among the Japanese in North I think we lost. Hello? Yeah, we can just barely hear you. You froze up. Okay, let me try that a little bit. I'm going to get as close to the mic as I can. So, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, the biggest change I think will be Japanese in North America. You essentially have these groups of Japanese Christians who've been told that they are free to practice their religion. There is a smaller group of people keeping herd on them, the samurai and uh, a, uh, a few merchants and craftsmen who are followers of Shintoism, Buddhism, Confucianism. And the, it's going to be a matter of survival for them to work together. So I think there is the potential for an increase in tolerance developing there eventually. Um, so that would be it for me. The, it seems to me, uh, and you're all welcome to throw virtual brickbats at me, but it seems to me that um, the thrust of religion in the 1632 universe is toward increasing toleration. Um, the, the 30 years war was about not tolerating differences of sect um, and it has been just stopped cold. Um, A little bit of two steps for one step back maybe. Well yeah but the actual ground war in Germany has basically, um, uh, the USE has stopped in and declared peace. Uh, you, will, you will stop now uh, and uh, we'll, we'll change things. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see whether the USE uh, becomes a, uh, um, a multi-faith um, toler tolerant state or whether it's really going to be a Lutheran state with a whole bunch of barely tolerated other sects. Uh, Not that many Lutherans in the USE. There's no way it can become a Lutheran state. Not even formally. It's, so what do, you, what do you think it will be? I think even the floated idea of having each of the provinces having a official state church is beyond what they can accomplish for the simple reason that the various provinces that the Council of Conference of Copenhagen threw together in 1634 means that practically every one of the European USC provinces is highly mixed in religion now. Essentially, you have Pomerania, Mecklenburg, mm -hmm. and Braunschweig, Brunswick, that are basically fairly solidly Lutheran. You have Bavaria and Tyrol that are essentially major highly majority Catholic. Mm -hmm. That's a minority. Every other of the provinces has now such a mixture of religion in the proportions of its population that they're going to look at what's coming out of Magdeburg and saying, 
we can't do this. You're going to have to let all of us go the way of the Oberpfalz. Okay. Um, I'm getting the, I'm getting the uh, throat cutting sign from uh, our, uh, from our host. Uh, that's a great way to end this, this discussion besides. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it'd be nice if our uh, virtual audience would give us a virtual round of applause. <laughs>